Well, hello again, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the third part of my Affinity Photo editing routine, if you like. Um, I shouldn't call it a tutorial. There are many people on YouTube, much, much, much better place than me to give you technical hints and tips on uh, the finer aspects of Affinity. Um, I'll put a link to a couple of the channels that I follow um, down below in the notes. So if you want to get more technical, <clears throat> check out those links because they're very good. The image you can see on screen now is um, where we left off at the end of session two. And on the left hand side, of course, the image that came straight out of camera. As I've said from the very beginning, this is a very meh sort of image. I could have done with <clears throat> either getting closer to it or having a longer lens with me couldn't do either so we have to make do with uh, what we've got really um, 16 megapixel xe2 image so uh, you know the more we crop into it the less quality we're keeping but nevertheless the end result is acceptable in my eyes anyway so swapping over to affinity photo <clears throat> Here we are, this is the image as we left it. Uh, we had cropped it, as you could quite clearly see. We'd put a, a gradient into the sky to bring down uh, the um, exposure in the sky. We had tweaked um, saturation, uh, vibrance, things like that. So this is where we're starting from at the moment. Now I'm cheating in order to keep this third section relatively short. Um, I'm going to swap over now to a very much more modified version of this shot, which I have already been working on uh, earlier on today. So you can see that there is a big difference between uh, the image as we left it at the end of episode two and where I'm at at the moment with this one. I've changed the sky completely, which is something that you will possibly um, like to do with some of your images. If you've got a very, very bland looking sky, it can be sometimes fun and beneficial to try swapping it out. Is it playing fair? Is it distorting reality? Of course it is, but again, as I've mentioned before, every time we take a photo we do distort reality. If you do decide to do this sort of thing you need to make sure that the sky you are choosing fits the image that you are working on. Um, this one works okay because the clouds are receding into a fairly misty distance so it sort of fits in with the overall feel of the day if you like. Now, I'll draw your attention to the right hand side. I've got the layers tab open at the moment and it might look rather daunting. Um, what I would say to you is that the most important thing you can do when working with layers is to rename them as you create them one by one. What I've done here is to duplicate the foreground <clears throat> and you can see it's called foreground here. We have the original background image. So what I did was to duplicate the foreground, that's the beach and the yacht, complete with the mast which goes up into the sky. So that was the first thing that I duplicated. I then copied and pasted it onto the background. Then I decided to make a selection of the stream area in the foreground and you can see that I've called it stream imaginative um, and then I have decided to import the sky of my own choosing. Mm -hmm. Then what I've done is to make various adjustments that's why you can see these indented layers here uh, with regard to the stream I made a brightness and contrast adjustment to that and I also did an exposure adjustment to the stream. Um, when I say uh, stream it is the uh, reflected 
version of the sky that is being referred to here. So what I've done is to um, copy a section of the sky. That's why it's renamed sky section. And uh, the, um, the important thing to do, of course, if you're doing a, a reflection of anything in water, you have to flip it. So it's been inverted and then I've uh, altered the exposure and the brightness and contrast and also the transparency. Uh, you need to make it sort of semi-transparent. I've not gone to any great um, accuracy with this. It's all been done fairly rapidly this morning. Um, and if I start to sort of turn some of these images off, you will begin to see what I mean. So if I remove that stream section straight away, you can see that suddenly it looks odd. Um, uh, it, it, it looks, in my opinion anyway, better if I turn the stream reflection back on. It's more in keeping with the overall image now. Being picky and pedantic, I should also have done this section of stream up here in the far distance. And that's a mistake on my behalf. If this was an image that I was really proud of and wanted to uh, shout it from the rooftops, as it were, then I really ought to have done something with this small section of stream in the far distance. But I haven't. But nevertheless, if I turn the reflected sky off in the stream area, you get what I'm talking about. And the same thing will apply if we uh, turn off any of these sort of sections. Um, so without the uh, background image, you can see that we've got an empty canvas, uh, no sky whatsoever. Um, but the adjustments are really things that you do, um, it's personal preference and you do it by eye and you make a decision as to how bright or how dark you want the elements to be in that image. Um, in terms of time, um, that's taken me probably 30 minutes to do, uh, not very carefully. Um, if I was doing it, you know, uh, and being really critical, it would probably take me an hour to accomplish this kind of uh, result, as it were. And you're probably thinking, why on earth did you bother, Alan? Well, <laughs> I've done it for you guys. Um, so that's the way to think about your layers. Point number one, the most important thing, particularly when you get into multiple layers, is to rename them. Okay, very easy to do and it helps an awful lot. Because let's say, for example, I, I wanted to get rid of this buoy here, um, which is marking where the little yacht would be when it's floating on the water, um, the, the anchor point. So if I wanted to get rid of that, I would select my uh, clone brush tool, for example, and we'll select an area of sand, bang, and then start to get rid of it and nothing's happening. And the reason is that we've got the wrong layer selected. Okay, we have got, um, let's try it on the background and suddenly it's working. So do you see what I mean? It's important. It helps an awful lot to rename your layers. And then when you are when you do something like I've just done and you think, why the heck isn't this thing working? It's because you've not got the right layer selected. So once it's highlighted, that is the layer that you're gonna be working on. Um, I just thought for a bit of fun, I would show you the my, my personal preference, my personal take on this particular shot. Uh, that's where it ended up um, with me. I don't know whether it's still anything to shout about. Uh, I've cropped it an awful lot more. Let's magnify it. And you can see that, um, you know, we are losing uh, definition. Let's put it that way. Now, there's an interesting development which has come along um, in the couple of years since this shot was taken in as much as software packages now are using artificial intelligence, AI, uh, to actually um, 
improve the overall resolution of a given image. Uh, one of the other software packages that I make use of is uh, On One Photo Raw, the 2022 version, and that has a very powerful AI section for resizing images. So that if I wanted to, um, I could resize this and print it out to A3. Having said that, I haven't done it yet, so you know, bear that in mind. Um, I'll return to that software uh, package in a future video because um, it ties in quite nicely with my uh, camera that I've recently purchased, the Olympus OMD EM1. So there we are. That's um, that image really taken to the uh, to the nth degree. Um, you know, it, it may or may not be worth bothering with uh, in any case, but it's an attractive enough little shot. Now, um, what did I want to show you after that? So this is an image that I took um, probably about 12 months ago. I suspect it was during lockdown. Um, it's irrelevant. Um, it's the uh, it's adjoining it's a dry dock adjoining the Albert dock uh, down in Liverpool and it's one of the uh, ships that's painted in dazzle camouflage again it's you know it's yeah however I think we can improve it and I wanted to pick another so-so image um, and illustrate the other package that I use within affinity and that is the Nick Collection. Now, um, Nick Collection, I believe they're on the fifth um, iteration of it now. Nick Collection Color Effects Pro 5. <clears throat> now, if you want to download that uh, particular software, it will cost you, I think it's £135 at the moment here in the UK. However, there is an earlier version which is still available free of charge and that's the Nick Collection Color Effects 4 but it is still freely available uh, just to make sure that it still works I have downloaded it this morning and reinstalled it for you so I'm happy to tell you that it's free it's a safe download and once you've got it installed into Affinity or indeed uh, Photoshop because it it's perfectly happy in, in either software um, it's really quite flexible. Now, with regard to your filters, you have a choice within Affinity Photo. We have a pull down menu at the top, which is the one that most people see straight away. And you can see that you have a small selection of filters here, typically the blur, sharpen, distort, etc., etc. Now those are all well and good, but um, if I actually click on one and tell it to do an auto color balance, auto color correction, it has changed it fractionally. Sometimes it works to the advantage of the image. Sometimes it looks horrible. The point is that nothing has changed with regard to our layers. We haven't got any additional layer so I'm just going to remove that filter. So we're back with the original image. Now the other option within Affinity are the live filters, which appear down here underneath this thing that looks like a, an hourglass. Uh, if we click on that, we get a, a greater list of available filters. So I'm going to pick a vignette. We pick the filter that we're interested in. You can see we get a little sub menu here and we can play around with things like the exposure. So we can either make it a lighter vignette or a darker vignette. We can change the hardness and softness of the result. We can change its scale and we can change its shape. Okay. I want to make it nice and soft and it's a bit on the big side there so let's take it out like so now if we're happy with that we just click on okay 
um, but what I want to highlight to you is if you look down the right hand side on the layers it's put it in as an adjustment layer which means that you can come back to it at a later stage in development and tweak it if necessary so the live filters in Affinity are much more flexible than the ones up here in the pull down menu worth bearing in mind so we will delete that and it's gone from our layer Nick collection on the other hand does appear in your filters pull down from the top and if you install it correctly it will appear as a plugin you can see Nick collection I'm going to select color effects pro now there are several within uh, Nick collection we've got silver effects pro 2 which gives you a selection of monochrome black and white filters very useful you've got HDR which I hardly ever use and I never bother with sharpening uh, but the color effects pro 4 is the one that I personally use a lot the two filters that I come back to time and again are this one which uh, it, it has popped up straight away because it's the last one that I used is the contrast color range and that's better with the default uh, so you are given a set of sliders and you can see that if I change this slider here it's affecting different colors within the image um, you also have a separate slider for the actual contrast of those colors and then you can also adjust your brightness and overall image contrast as you see fit as well as that you've got controls for shadows and highlights and you also have these control points which I will come on to in a moment but for the time being I'm gonna say okay to that so color effects pro 4 is doing its thing after a few seconds it will load that into um, affinity so this is the saved version the cropped version we can now quite happily go back into uh, Nick collection color effects pro 4 now I don't want the same filter applied twice that's never usually a good idea um, but I'm not too happy with the sky so I'm going to put in a graduated filter graduated neutral density uh, we can adjust everything including the blend we can make it harsh or soft we can adjust the height of that filter Um, you can change its rotation and, and, and everything else like that now um, I'm also going to add my borders click OK and it will export that back into affinity where you can save it or export it and do whatever you like with it so Nick collection color effects pro 4 really good obviously the latest version um, five is going to be even better one would hope um, but this works perfectly well within affinity it's very easy to use um, and it does have an awful lot of flexibility file I'm just going to save that so with this free version of Nick collection um, I'll just do one more demo for you and I'll show you the silver effects pro 2 which um, you can see that on the left hand side you have a total of 38 different effects um, they're all described quite nicely you can go for high structure just let's uh, go with that one that's actually quite nice Now, even though we've lost the sort of dazzle effect camouflage paint on the ship 
um, I actually prefer that as an image to the uh, to the color original. So if you are interested in the free um, knit collection download, I'll put a link for you in the notes and you can download it for free, install it in Affinity. Um, if you get stuck doing that, again, there are YouTubers out there who will guide you through the process. If that's uh, a bit of a pain for you, then feel free to uh, mention it to me in a comment or email me. I hope that's given you a little bit of an insight into the workings of Affinity Photo. As I said right at the very beginning, I personally think there are maybe 10 or 15 controls and adjustments that you guys need to get used to. Not necessarily master, but you need to get used to because you will come back to the same ones time and time again in different images. If you can get to that stage, then you'll be well on the way to, to mastering it, to be honest with you. And then just rely on the, the experts on YouTube to guide you through the more technical bits that you only ever need once in a blue moon. It's a personal thing, but that's my own opinion anyway. So I hope you've enjoyed it. I know these aren't the most inspiring videos. Uh, they're quite difficult to do as well as I've discovered. Um, but nevertheless, uh, if you'd like to see more, then please give me a shout out in the comment section. Uh, um, in the meantime, I will say look after yourselves, enjoy your photography and post-production editing, and I'll see you very soon. Bye-bye for now.